All across the country, people are coming together to speed up what we can learn about health. The All of Us Research Program is calling on one million people to join us as we try to change the future of health. For your family, for future generations, for all of us. Visit joinallofus.org and find out how you can become one in a million. I'm Kelsey Mahaffey, All of Us Project Director for 50 Forward, and with me is Elijah Avery, All of Us Outreach Coordinator. 50 Forward, located in Nashville, Tennessee, is a national community engagement partner for the All of Us Research Program. October is Global Diversity Awareness Month, which is a month to celebrate and increase awareness about the diversity of different cultures and ethnicities. And we thought, what better way to celebrate than by showcasing some amazing art from around the globe? That's right. So what we decided to do is put together a Facebook Live event with local artist and educator Marla Faith, who curated an amazing slideshow containing a lot of diverse and unique artwork from very diverse artists. Now, since this event was such a success, we decided what we're going to do is post it as a video so that those of you who missed it are able to watch at your own leisure. But before we cut to the presentation, we'd like to give a brief overview of what the All of Us Research Program is about. This is a new initiative from the National Institutes of Health to advance precision medicine. We are seeking 1 million people from diverse backgrounds living in the United States to enroll and volunteer to share their health data. Right now, our healthcare system is one size fits all. And all of us seeks to change that by seeking to include diversity of all forms in medical research. You can learn more about the program by visiting our website at joinallofus.org 50 forward and learn how you can become one in a million. Diversity in research is very important for several reasons. Firstly, where we live, how we live, and our backgrounds can all impact our health. Secondly, many groups of people have not been included in research data in the past, and this means researchers know a little bit less about their health. But, but by studying data from a diverse group of people, researchers can learn more about what makes people sick or keeps them healthy. What researchers learn could lead to better treatment and disease prevention for all of us. Data from the All of Us Research Program could someday help researchers identify what makes people more likely to develop a disease. It also would help them find out how environment, lifestyle, and genetics all impact one's health, and it will all help build better tools for detecting health conditions and also encourage healthy lifestyle habits. That's right. And now Elijah and I would like to introduce our presenter, Marla Faith. Marla is an artist, writer, and educator living in Nashville, Tennessee. She has taught art and art history in schools and museums here locally, as well as in New York and Chicago. She holds a BFA in painting from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and an MS in Museum Leadership from Bank Street College in NYC. She has published two books of her art in poetry and is about to put out a third. In Nashville, her art has been featured at the Parthenon and the airport, as well as throughout the country. It really was an honor and a privilege to have Marla as our guest and we hope you enjoy the art as much as we did. So please sit back and grab a cup of tea and enjoy this virtual walk with us through our Global Art Museum. So it's, um, these artists are all nationally and internationally recognized who I'm about to show you. Really diverse um, mediums, subject matter, styles, all very, very original. And um, I, a lot of them are quite international. This is an artist I've been interested in for a long time. Her name is John Quick to See Smith, and she's a Native American artist born on a reservation in Montana and now um, lives in um, 
New Mexico, where she's an artist in residence. This is called Trade, it's from 1992. And if you, it's very, very large. You can tell by the things hanging above it. So when looking at any art, it's really good to just stand in front and see how, how it makes you feel. What do you see? What did the artist do to make you feel a certain way? Why maybe did the artist do it? How did the artist do it? This is a mixed media collage piece. It looks like an abstract painting at first. Words are newspapers incorporated. There's the empty canoe. And then above it are the things that the white men traded with to take the Native Americans land. So her work is beautiful and political. This is another one by her. And this one is uh, called Going Forward, Looking Back. It's from 1996. By the way, all of the artists I'm showing you are sort of my age and older. There's a couple who are in their 40s. There's a couple who are in their 90s. Most of them are between 60 and 80. So they do say that our most productive creative years are between 50 and 80. So good news for all of us. Um, again, this one to me, it's so um, mesmerizing and compelling. I just want to look everywhere. I look at the drips. I look at the different blues. I look at the the handprints. Um, her father actually was in, in business with, with horses somehow, a, a horse trader. Uh, but the, the horse is bareback. You know, what does it say? You want to go closer and read it. She actually had one of her works in the Native American Women's Show that was recently at the Frist here in Nashville, for those of you fortunate enough to uh, see that incredible exhibit. This one is uh, called Tribal Map. It's from 2000. And these are the names of what places were called and the people who lived there before the United States uh, created our own names on, on top of them. She did many in this series. So you just take it in. I mean, imagine how long an artist takes to create something. And most of us, we go in a museum and we just look at it quickly and walk right by. But any artwork will speak to you if you stand in front of it and give it time. And then after let, allowing it in, then you can read the label and see what the title is. And maybe that helps you um, to understand it more. Maybe it's a doorway into it. We move to Ella Natsui. And um, I saw a huge exhibit of his at the Brooklyn Museum some years ago. These are like gigantic kente cloths. They're very shimmery. At first, it looks like a Gustave Klemt golden painting from 1900. But they're textile arts. They're like sculpt sculptures. They can move. Who, at whatever curator, preparator is going to hang it up, it will move and change. Can you tell what it's made out of? Ella Natsui is uh, born, was born in 1944. He's 76. He works in Nigeria. He's from Ghana. And he started collecting bottle caps of liquor bottles. And he would flatten them out. Um, into circles or also the rings that go around the neck of a liquor bottle, rum particularly that uh, they brought from the uh, West Indies in and uh, caused alcoholism and different kind of things. And you can see he punctures them with little holes and ties them together with wire. And he's got a whole workshop of people working for him. So it's a very, very communal thing. The first artist we saw, she works large, but she works by herself traditional medium of oil paint, but also much mixed media in with it as well. Most of the artists I'm going to show you, you can't buy these art supplies at an art store. They're recycled materials. They're upcycled. Some countries and cultures, they don't have a choice to recycle. They have to because maybe they're, they're poorer and they need to reuse, reuse things. Like think about cars in Cuba and how they, they've upcycled those. So this is um, creating beauty, transforming something that could be considered garbage into beauty. What can you find in your own house, in your on the ground outside that you could possibly have a vision to transform? Sticking with this golden theme, these are uh, painted photographs by uh, a younger woman, she's only 40, um, inspired by Gustav Klimt. 
She's an American photographer named Tawny Ch Chapman, and she was born in Japan, but uh, she lives in, uh, New in Maryland, I'm sorry, in Maryland. These are 40 by 40 inches, sometimes three by five feet, sometimes uh, four by six feet photographs of her daughters that she embellishes with acrylic, with gouache, with 24 karat gold. And uh, some of these are from a series called The Redemption. Um, the one on the right is titled, I have yet to see the world, but I have hopes. And they're celebrating the diversity uh, of, of culture of, of black hair. This black is beautiful and the weight that so many, especially black women carry on their heads, of their, of their hair. And to embrace it and, and all of the different ways um, it can be beautiful. So she's um, pretty amazing. I've only discovered her recently. You can follow her on Instagram, on Facebook. This is the cool thing about our new medias for those of us older who only found out about artists through magazines and uh, museums in the past. Okay, now we're going to Japan. Although she did live in New York for a while, Yayoi Kusama is 91 years old, born in 1929. This is in her one of her infinity rooms, and I put this one next because of the dots. She's been obsessed with dots since she was a young woman, and it was a way for her to um, to heal herself. Art is a healing meditation. She had lots of psychological family trauma when she was younger, and by repeating this motif of dots over and over and over, it, it, help, it helped her, and she's still doing dots. This, this room is in museums all over the world. It's a lot, many of them have these infinity rooms where you stand in it for a couple minutes, and it just goes on and on and on. So it's not the kind of art you could have in your old own home. But perhaps the sort of pumpkin on the right, you could buy that if you're an art collector. This is a portrait of her. Um, she still is into dots after all these years. She went home in 1973 from after uh, half a dozen years in the New York art scene to Japan, to Tokyo. And in 77, she moved into a mental institution where she still lives. And she has her own big studio with assistants right across the street. And just a few years ago, she opened her own art museum of her art just down the street. So pretty cool, um, you know, what you can do under any circumstances. This is one of her obliteration rooms in which people participate. People can take these flowers, and, you know, there's thousands of these flowers and they can just put them up everywhere and obliterate. And how do you, how do you move out of emotional anxiety that maybe some of us are in right now. I know for me, art has been what I've been doing almost daily since this whole pandemic began. It's a way of soothing myself and a way of uh, a mirroring where I'm at and a meditation, a healing, and I encourage everyone to, to trust, to create your own art. So um, uh, Oldenburg, Claus Oldenburg, the famous sculptor who made the big soft sculptures, was inspired by her, um, some other ones I didn't show you of hers. Lucas Samaras, another artist back in the 70s, stole her idea about the mirrored room. She influenced a lot of people. There's a 2017 uh, film about her. And then we move to a, a art with nature. Andy Goldsworthy collaborates with nature. These don't exist for very long. The only thing that stays are the photographs. And there's also two wonderful documentaries that have been done about him, um, which you can probably watch for free, Rivers and Tides 2001 and uh, Leaning into the Wind 2018. So he works in Scotland. He grew up in England. Um, he's a British sculptor, but look what he sculpts with, with ice, with snow. He, he does, works all by himself, putting these together out in the cold and then they melt. But he takes photographs of his work and therefore it that's what uh, keeps it, what keeps it from being just temporary, transient work. Uh, the ice, you know, he very carefully puts around that tree and you can see in the films it breaks, he has to put it back together again. Sometimes he is hired by museums to create a piece. He has a permanent piece at the um, Storm King Art Center in Mountainville, New York. 
I know he had a piece at the, on the rooftop garden of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, but most often he works alone in nature. And these are rocks that somehow he cut through over there. Here's just a little bit more about him. These are not painted leaves. He searches for leaves that are changing colors, pins them together into this long uh, sort of serpent, the one on the left. And then when this was done, he put it in a river and you see it floating down the river and it's gone. But he sells many beautiful books of his art, which is how you get to keep his art. And you can try imitating his art in your own backyard with the fall leaves that we're having right now. Maybe make a circle just like that. So, going, uh, continuing in this uh, idea of impermanent, this is made of colored sand. And some of you may have seen um, the Tibetan Buddhist monks when they were at the Frist Art Museum in Nashville um, just a couple of years ago, creating one of these. Uh, they do some rituals and chants first. And then there's four to six men in their robes and they are making this mandala. A mandala is a design that's a radial symmetry, but this is very specific. It's, it's been passed down through you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years and very meaningful. And if you were above this looking down, it would look like a Tibetan Buddhist temple, in fact. Um, here's a, a picture of them doing it. They, they draw it out with chalk first. And then usually they have masks on so they won't breathe the sand out of place. But these long metal tubes contain the sand and they knock, knock, knock on it. And the sand comes out little by little to fill in these spaces. And this is, you know, people watching, watching it because they've brought their, their art to the world. It's not just in Tibet anymore. It's, it's everywhere, just like the Dalai Lama had to leave Tibet. And he's everywhere now. So oftentimes art can reflect a culture and a religion. Um, what we saw was new art so far. Now this is very traditional. This doesn't change. This is the same forever um, and ever. Did I not just show this image? Oh, and he, what do they do at the end? They sweep it away. They, how can they do that? Well, they've taken a picture of it. There's lots of documentaries. But the idea is non-attachment, and that's the whole Buddhist idea, right? Non-attachment, this beautiful, profound life is here right now. Love it, embrace it, be kind, be loving, because we don't know, know when it's going to end. And they do blessings on the sand. They give it in little bags to people who were there, or they put it in the river, just like Andy Goldsworthy did with his leaves, and they let it go on. So um, very interesting to me. Um, going right next to Tibet, to China. So contemporary artist, uh, he's my age, um, Ai Weiwei. Uh, you may have heard of him. He's made a lot of national news. Uh, here he is um, breaking a Han Dynasty urn, an ancient vase in the back in the photographs, and dipping real Han Dynasty Don on Dynasty urns in paint, in bright colored paint, and then painting the Coca-Cola Coca logo on another one. He's a political artist. Um, artists often reflect their times. You know, I mean, there are still artists who are doing landscapes and still lifes and portraits and floral paintings, non-objective art, but a lot of artists reflect either their inner struggles and or their, their contemporary times, which is what he is doing. His father was an exiled poet in China. He was under house arrest. He was arrested for making um, art that um, was controversial. This one is to remind us of the evils of Mao's communist regime. And Mao had said to create a new world, one must destroy the old one. So that's what he's doing there. And in this one, they look just like sunflower seeds, right? Well, they're made of porcelain and they're individually painted and he's standing on them. And uh, this was at the uh, Tate Museum. It still is, it's at the Tate Modern, but you can no longer walk on it because the dust from the uh, porcelain comes up into your lungs. But the idea of the, all these Chinese women think made in China, in fact, in, in his own factory being paid well to individually paint every one of porcelain, porcelain, 
you know, many of you have good china at home. We still call it china, good dishes. Um, if, if there's a tradition of, of porcelain in China and the whole idea that we're all individuals, but yet there's a sea of humanity here. And if we all work together, change can come, right? That's what we're hoping. If we all work together. We're powerless unless we act together. So um, very interesting, interesting artist, lots of documentaries about him. I don't know if anyone out there can read Chinese. It says she lived happily for seven years in this world. This was shown in Munich um, after he finally was allowed to leave um, China in 2015, he moved to Berlin. This past year, he's moved to the uh, UK um, in Cambridge. But um, back in, oh, this was exhibited 2016, I guess this is, is this one that happened? The life jackets, 14,000, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's the next one. No, this, <laughs> forgive me, I was, my notes were mixed up. This was in 20,000, uh, 2009. There were 80,000 people killed in Sichuan, uh, China, when there was a giant earthquake. And all of these poorly constructed schools were, were uh, just collapsed on all the students. So every one of those little blue squares is a backpack and the yellow and the green and the red. So this is sort of what kicked him out of China, you know, doing this kind of art, calling attention to, to that. Here, this is the one that was, um, is also in, this is in Munich, I believe. If you look closely, what are those orange things? This is the one from 20, uh, 2016. This is about the refugee crisis and those are 14,000 life jackets. You know, we don't hear about it as much. It says safe passage in, in, in the middle. So these are temporary pieces. He is not making a painting for someone to buy and hang on a wall. And no one is commissioning him to do this. These are his own ideas. And then uh, places allow him to make his statements. And then there's documentaries, there's photographs. And this is, you know, how he, he would make his living. But art is off the canvas a lot of times now. You know, it's more about your ideas. So Kara Walker, um, some of you may have seen her work. She's in major museums all over the place. You can always recognize her distinctive uh, style of these black paper cutout silhouettes. And the theme is always the antebellum South. And there's racism, sexism, um, violence uh, in, involved in, in all of her works. These are two of the more um, gentle ones. The piece, usually, and usually her work covers an entire wall in a museum and there's colored lights with it. And it's a story. She's a narrative artist, a figurative artist. She is from California. She's 51. She was raised in Atlanta where she was introduced to racism. She'd never met it in California. And then her art took that turn. She lives in New York. Um, this is called a calliope, the thing on the left, and it makes music with steam. And it's been installed in different places and it would be in traveling fairs and it's got jazz and you know blues and different music uh, coming, coming out of it. And it's actually got designs on all four sides. One of my favorite pieces by her was done at the Domino Sugar Factory in Brooklyn. Um, uh, that piece was from 2018. This is from 2014. It's called Sugar Baby, and it reflects on the troubled history of sugar. You see these little bronze figures of these little boys who were, you know, had to go pick all the sugar. And here's this mammy type creature made completely out of sugar. So again, it's a sculpture. It's a scul it's sculpture. It's temporary. A lot of artists work through different mediums, um, you know, paint, painting, collage, mixed media, sculpture in uh, site-specific art. This was made specifically for this Domino Sugar Factory before it was uh, torn down. Here you can see how it was put together on the right with these sort of blocks of sugar. And this uh, is made of sugar too, but it's by a different artist. Vic Muniz, one of my favorite artists, he's from Brazil. He's 59 years old and he lives in New York. 
And he went to, this is from his Sugar, Sugar Children series, they're Polaroids of kids when he was visiting the Caribbean, St. Kitts, and he saw all their families were in charge of uh, working on the sugar plantation. And it was like the families and the children and he had all this sweetness zapped out of them. And he took these photographs and then he, um, of the photograph, he made a drawing of it using sugar. So he had black paper <clears throat> and he sprinkled white sugar onto the paper to make this photograph. And it doesn't stay there, right? It would rot. So he takes a photograph of it, which is what we see, a large photograph that might be an exhibited in a museum. But what he actually did with this series too, is he took the sugar from each photograph, put it in a glass jar and uh, taped the photograph on top of the jar. And that's how he exhibited this series. It's really um, incredibly creative artist with very unusual materials. I'd like you to look at this and see if you can tell what he made this out of. And you might recognize the image. Those of you familiar with Jackson Pollock from the 1950s and his large action paintings where he threw paint on canvas. This is a copy of a famous uh, photograph in 1950 by Hans Namath. So Vic Muniz had to be able to copy the photograph, copy Jackson Pollock, um, Pollock style and do it all with Bosco's chocolate syrup. It's part of a series that he was doing with peanut butter, with jam, with chocolate syrup. You know, again, transitory things that don't last. But uh, this art is sometimes called appropriation, where you appropriate, where you take someone else's art and you redo it your way. You know, you uh, collage it a new way, you paint it a different way. So this is um, what he, he was doing for, for a, a, quite a while. Um, not sure if there's a political statement in this one, but he does move forward with that. Oh, here's, this is just from probably a few years ago. Um, I was talking about Gustav Klemt before, the uh, Austrian uh, Vienna secessionist who was known for, especially this one, the kiss, his golden paintings. Well, this isn't Gustav Klemp's, but it's a copy of his done perfectly with cutouts from magazines. So those of you who think collage is using magazines, here's a up way of doing it. You know, this is probably, you know, five, six by six feet tall. So then he went to, um, to the largest garbage dump in, in Brazil and spent three years there working there. There's a fantastic documentary called Wasteland that's about this. And I'm trying to see in my notes if I wrote what year this is from. It's at least uh, 10, oh, okay, 2008. So 12 years ago. So there was a famous painting by Jacques Louis, um, Louis David from 1793. You might recognize it on the left and he's imitated it. And but how big is this piece? Look at all the junk around it, the garbage. Um, there's Mother Mary on the right with, with uh, baby Jesus and um, his cousin Joseph. These are, he takes famous paintings and he hired the people who worked in the dump to go collect garbage every day and bring it back. And he paid them a good wage to do that. And then they created these amazing, um, renditions of the famous work and he was way up here taking a photograph down of it and so he's got these you know big like five by six feet photographs well you can see one above the orange chairs on the right by the wall there that he exhibited in major museums and paid for the some of those workers to come with him to the museum they'd never been in a museum to see themselves on the museum walls and then what does he do he gives the money back to them so that they can help arise out of uh, their predicament there. Some of them, that was their home. They wanted to stay. Maybe they opened a library there. Maybe they, they joined forces and created you know, better situations um, for the, themselves there. But really, um, really intriguing artist. So I wanted to uh, put one of his more recent works out. There's a, a book about to come out of these. These are his postcard, uh, postcards from nowhere series. And there he's been collecting postcards for decades. Again, these are, you know, five by six feet tall kind of um, collages or montages, assemblages where he's cut up 
all these postcards and created imaginary landscapes. You know, he's this time he's not looking at a photograph of Kyoto, Japan to do this. He's, he's working from his memory of what it was like to be there. And he, the book is filled with all over the world, these, you know, really um, uplifting, you know, images, uh, magical, magical kind of images. So $250 on Amazon. Double set though. Okay, moving to someone else, very colorful, Nick Cave. Maybe those of you in Nashville, maybe some of you got to see his exhibit when it was at the Frist, again, just maybe a year or so ago, these uh, life-size mannequins filled a whole, the whole downstairs gallery. And um, they seem really, really happy at first, right? I mean, they're made of, um, what are this crocheting and, and toys and little whirly gig toys. And it looks like it could make a sound. And in fact, they're called sound suits and they were made to be worn and danced in. And Nick Cave, um, he uh, was born in 1959 in Missouri, he lives in Chicago. And he was, has been an artist, you know, his whole life. But he was sitting in the park after the uh, Rodney King um, beatings so long ago, 80s, um, I believe that that happened. Oh, nine, I think so. The Rodney King being the main, that was the 90, 92. Okay, so that was the first year he did this. He was sitting there. And he felt like he, you know, he was being seen for the color of his skin. And so he began collecting twigs and tying them together and tying them together and sudden, until suddenly he had this whole suit of twigs. And he, when he walked wearing it, he was in disguise. He had this alien second skin where no one could tell his, his, his gender, his class, his race, his sex, nothing, but it made sound. And so they were sound suits. They became these amazing sound suits and he got the whole community to take part. There's fantastic documentaries of the community choreographers and um, everybody working, sort of celebrating these sound suits that are now all over the country. And he, he believes that there's a state of urgency to use art right now as a change, change agent of diplomacy, how we engage with one another. You know, so it's not just a private working, but a way of connecting with community. And he did that while he was here at the Frist too. Going back to more traditional basket making, who's been to Charleston, South Carolina and seen these amazing sweetgrass baskets? This came over in the early 1700s from, um, from Africa. Uh, these sweetgrass basket makers that the, the Gula women in um, near Charleston, South Carolina, the woman's from Sound, uh, Mount Pleasant. Her name is Mary Jackson. She's now um, in museums all over the world, but she started out selling her baskets in the marketplace. And there's many people who do the same, the same style of basket, but she's known especially for her skill and bringing a bit more ingenuity, um, in innovativeness to her work. Her grandmother taught her mother, taught her. They all worked together making these baskets. And um, maybe you even have a similar one that you keep your onions on the counter in. I mean, these are still being sold today. They're finally being valued as fine art. That where is the line between craft and art? There's, there is no line anymore. It's all, it's all of equal beauty, which is it, quite cool to me. So um, she was, you know, she knew how to do this. She went to New York, uh, went to secretarial school, became a secretary, moved back to um, near Charleston, South Carolina. And it was only when she had to stay home, you know, with her kids that she was like, well, what am I going to do? Maybe I'll make some sweetgrass baskets. And then the sweetgrass was disappearing. It was, and so she made a whole coalition of people to replant the sweetgrass and, um, and started this whole movement to bring it back and just kept doing it. And now she works with her daughter and her granddaughter all making these together as well. So staying in the kitchen um, with uh, tea bags. This is an artist I only discovered this year, Ruby Silvios. And these are very small. We went from really large to something you could hold in your hand. You could probably even afford to buy some of her art. She's um, 63 years old. She's from the Philippines and lives in New York's Hudson uh, River Valley. And she began this tea series in 2015. She wanted to 
give herself the, uh, the challenge of to create every day with this as her theme, as her medium and subject, which is a really fun thing if you're stuck as an artist or even not as an artist, to give yourself that challenge. You know, how far can I go with this one medium or subject? And she's still doing that. Uh, she's also now making origami brassieres, uh, recycled food wrapper sh uh, shoes, uh, printed tea bag kimonos. Uh, and she uses acrylic and gouache and watercolor um, on her works. And some of you might, you know, recognize some of the tea bag uh, labels on her work. And I particularly love this um, one, Compassion Has No Limit, Kindness Has No en Enemy. And if you buy a Yogi brand tea, they have these kind of um, labels. And I've been using them in my own collages for years. And it's like, oh, someone else does that too. So you can even get messages out very, very tiny. And again, you can follow her on Instagram, Facebook. So I wanted to end with an artist who just works in traditional painting and sculpture. This is an, a huge oil painting because everything else I've shown you is nothing's been really just flat out painting by itself or sculpture. Um, so Kahinde Wiley, he's, he's in major, major museums. He is a 43-year-old artist who um, was born in LA, and I think he lives in New York, um, a reclining male. He just would bring in normal guys from off the street and put them in these exotic settings that you were had been reserved for very important people in, in portrait painting in the past and give them this new sense of, of beauty and worthiness. Uh, this is a copy of a famous painting, but he put the young man on the horse instead. The painting was called uh, Officer of the Hussars, and I believe it was, um, he did this, oh, the original was in the 1700s. So um, you might have seen this painting. He was commissioned to do Obama's official portrait, which is at the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and in it, the flowers represent um, the flowers from Hawaii, where Obama was born, um, from um, Africa, where his father was from, and from uh, Chicago, where he lived uh, before he was president. You know, you look at his seemingly large hands. Uh, what does that, what does it say? What does it say that he's in nature? What does it say? He's in a relaxed pose, but a very serious pose totally different than all the portraits in the National Portrait Gallery. And I did want to mention too that Obama was, um, he, where did I write this? Oh, he, the All of Us research program that is sponsoring this talk was begun under when Obama was, was in office. So um, I thought that was interesting. Very, very large, large paintings. His most recent uh, work is a sculptor, sculpture, sorry, um, and Notice how this is different. It's your typical equestrian uh, statue or monument where some important person is riding a horse, but this man is wearing a hoodie, he's got dreadlocks, and this is in Times Square. This was exhibited a year ago, exactly this time last fall for two months, and now it's um, permanently owned by uh, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And Virginia has the, the most um, the Confederate sculpt sculptures and monuments of anywhere in the country. So I think it's pretty cool that they have this now um, because where have, where have women been? Where have black, black men been in the history of art? And now people are bringing them back where they belong. So with that, I want to invite you to a workshop that um, I will be leading. Um, it's limited to 12 participants. Uh, and we'll be doing collages with materials you have around the house. You can find more out about it. I'm going to turn the screen back to my uh, cohorts here at 54 Head. Stop share. Okay, and there you guys are. Oh, wow, Marla, that just simply amazing. Um, I think this is the third time we've gone through it, Elijah and I just um, doing our practices, and I'm still just as blown away as when we were looking at these earlier this week.
Um, I cannot thank you enough for putting this together and for sharing uh, this gorgeous representation of artists from around the globe. And uh, it struck me, you know, I couldn't help but see how diversity enriches all of our lives and the correlation there of, um, you know, diversity in all forms. Not only were you showing us artists that were from around the globe and from different countries and different ethnicities and different ages, but also the diversity in the materials that they were using. Just so, so interesting um, and fascinating. Uh, it reminds me of the All of Us Research Program too. You know, when we speak of diversity within the program, we're, we're not just talking about race and ethnicity, uh, but age and health status, environment, where people live, access to medical care, all these things affect one's health. And so it was really neat to tie, tie those two themes together. Um, so right now, uh, for those of you that are sticking with us, we're going to show a quick three-minute video on the importance of diversity in medical research with the All of Us Research Program. And then we'll be right back for a casual conversation and hopefully an interactive chat. If you've had questions or comments in the chat box, we will get to those. So enjoy this quick, excuse me, quick video, and then we will be right back with you. So much of what we've done in medicine over the years has not really taken into account individual differences. And this is an opportunity to be part of something, something historic. Most studies and most clinical trials have always been with the average white male. So as we start thinking about this in the context of building trust, I think we get back that trust by involving the community. Not saying you come to us or we'll just do things to you. We're going to do things with you and in fact allow that information to be accessible to you, the individual. You're going to have some individuals that are going to say, yes, good, we're getting in on the ground level of a study. And then you're going to have those that have some trepidations about it. My thing is to bring them aboard and let them know that this is for the the greater good for them. We have input and, you know, without input, there's no buy-in. And without buy-in, there's no commitment. Without commitment, there's no success. Tuskegee happened. You know, we're not trying to hide that or sweep it under the rug, but communities of color will be at a disadvantage if we do not find ways to get by that. Whether the focus is asthma, whether the focus is infant mortality, whether the focus is diabetes, cancer or heart disease, communities of color are disproportionately impacted by them. It has always been playing catch up to make sure that they're even getting access, much less minimum service. Low income, underserved, and people of color are oftentimes very generous in giving something if they understand it. And they always do so with the intention that knowing this is not just about me, this is not just even about my family, it is about helping the community down the road. Being able to bring the Asian American population who is never at the table, not only to contribute to science, but to contribute to our ability to understand the nuances within those populations. I think it will provide a huge national data set so we can ask questions and make discoveries about healthcare that will better their own personal health and those of the communities that they are part of. Diversity strengthens the science. It could bridge some civil rights issues and inequities in healthcare across all races and ethnicities and culture. As a community of color, underrepresented, hidden, underserved, what would happen if you were not at the table? It is an issue of equity and it's an issue of justice as well. It is important for minorities to be a part of this or we will again be left with medications that are created for really other populations. I'm hopeful that we will be overwhelmed with folk. I always look at Henrietta Lacks, one person, one African-American woman that has been so instrumental and what we're learning today. I think as we look at that story and if we can convey that message in a more positive way, then they can see the benefit of what her life represents. I think it's an excellent way to discover who we really are and our true potential. That was a very informative and fantastic video. I love watching that video. It's honestly truly inspiring to hear about all these people's experiences. And I'm just happy to have you all back. 
And for those of you who may have now just tuned in, we're here with uh, Marla Faith, who has curated a fantastic global art slideshow. And it really is just a whole celebration of global diversity and awareness because it's Global Diversity and Awareness Month. And the All of Us Research Program lists diversity as one of its core values. I mean, that's what we're all about because medical research hasn't always seen everyone. And this program speaks to change that because I mean, I'd love to just start off this Q and A with an interactive chat, drawing a connection between the All of Us program and the art world. And as referenced in the video, most medical research has been based off the average white man. From what little I know about the art world, there seems to be a shift between that and in, in museums too, because that's how it was in the art world and how it is in the medical world too but that's starting to change. And with the planning and the mission statements towards diversity and equality and inclusion that the All of Us program uh, embodies. In fact, I did Google a quote before this presentation and it's from an independent curator, Larry Stokes Sims, who states, either the mainstream art world will catch up or they will be left behind. And I feel like that's the exact same with the, with the medical world too, with the growing diversity in this country, there needs to be some catching up. So Marla, could you please speak to the history of the art world and how it's been dominated by white men? Well, yes, the only way to get into a museum as a woman was to be nude on the walls. That was it. Um, I mean, back when I was in college in the seventies, we didn't know about very many women artists Definitely didn't know about any artists of color. I mean, things have changed a lot, but they're so far to go. But lately in the New York Times, um, they, they, they've been having stories about uh, museums all over that are trying to diversify their staff too, because who's choosing the art, right? Trying to diversify that um, to bring more people of color into museums. And, and I think they've been doing a really good job these last couple of years, I think it's it's starting to show. Um, so it makes me happy, you know, and especially as a young person of, of color, especially a young female person growing up, you want those role models. Um, all I had was Georgia O'Keeffe and Grandma Moses. Yeah, I too, Marla, love Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, I love the desert in the West and that speaks to me. So that, that art resonates with me. I wonder if we have our viewers out there sticking with us and Elijah is monitoring our, our Facebook chat and curious if you want to type in there maybe what your favorite piece was or what your favorite artist was that, that you have seen today. Had you heard of any of these artists, um, there were only, I believe, two, one or two, Marla, that I was even aware of. So just bringing these unknown artists out into the light, I just, I love that. So type us in the chat and let us know um, what spoke to you. What was your favorite piece? Um, have you heard of these artists? Did you happen to go to the Frist? Um, and see the Tibetan Buddhist monks. I was fortunate enough to attend that show. Marla, I don't know if you were there, uh, but it, it was um, inspiring and spiritual. It, it was um, an amazing experience. And it, it struck me when I saw them, the whole room was just hushed, complete silence. Um, and it was very, very crowded, hundreds of people, everybody trying to take photos. But even without a sign saying, please don't speak, everybody could just sense um, something spiritual was happening there and just uh, what that evoked. So that was very moving for me to see your, your slides of the Tibetan monks and, and remember that I was there when they, they did their, their interactive piece um, at the Frist. And I would say for me, like, uh, as, just like Kelsey, I, I hadn't seen any of these pieces before and known that much about any of the artists. 
and just to see how they just use these everyday objects to make something that's just so incredible a lot of the times it just it makes me feel like you know inspired that I might go grab some tea bags right after this uh this little panel and go make some like artwork and I think that's something that I hope the viewers can also uh be inspired by something that they want to go and do whether it be tea bags or anything they have lying around the house because it's just I mean as someone who likes to dabble in the arts I don't have anything in a museum obviously but I feel like it's something that's great for my health to participate in like my mental health especially when I mean we're trapped in the house is like for the whole quarantine it's like I can just make me rummage around through my garbage as gross as that sounds and possibly make some artwork out of it and I just like having that sort of outlet and seeing how these people use their mediums to convey various messages to people all about diversity and their own lives. Yeah, art reflects, uh, reflects your space, reflects the world. You know, going to a museum is like going to a holy, sacred place. When you mention the quiet, I mean, in general, in museums, people are quiet. They're taking it in. They're in, they don't have to go to the doctor because they're they're getting healed just being in front of the art often. And so there's no um, substitute for standing in front of real art. Um, you know, you can watch documentaries, you can have beautiful books about it, but really seeing beautiful art is um, is so important. And I, um, I was familiar with most of these, but that's because you know, I'm an artist and, and I know about this, but you're right, the general population knows about famous dead artists. They don't really know about living artists that much. And, and you have to sort of go out of your way a little to open up, up to that, I think. And hopefully once people have found out about this, I mean, these, these people are international. They're all over in the most major museums. Um, you know, no one is no one is like a poor struggling artist who I just showed you. They are all um, definitely recognized. Yeah, I love it also too, Marla, that you picked artists a lot of whom were over the age of fifty, um, being fifty forward, and we strive to embrace aging and champion older adults and. You know, th this is artwork from, major I think, was there only one in their 40s, Marla? There were two in their 40s. Um, okay. You know, I, I really think that that's when artists really reach their stride is after yeah. 50. You know, I don't even, honestly, I mean, I, my daughter is an artist. Um, she's almost 25, but I don't know any other young artists. I, you know, I mean, it's it's strange. Um, a, one, when, the more you do something, the more you, you do your practice, the better you get at it. And then people, maybe they took them seriously younger, but especially once they get older and they have this whole body of work that they're so serious about um, and, and they, they get that respect. Although most of these artists were recognized younger. Yeah. Would you say also uh, piggybacking on Kelsey's point, as far as like, yes they do have the time like more time to accumulate like work and practice and hone their craft would you say even though they also have more stories to tell as far as you know the older you are the more experiences you've had and the more you know feelings that you felt over the years and do would you say that plays into the um intensity sure the life well? experience but i also think the deeper you go into anything you know i mean i have a portrait i did behind me i did that some years ago based on a little black and white photograph but no one taught me how to do portrait painting i was mm -hmm. terrible at it when i started but i kept doing it i didn't give up making art is not about talent skill it is about persistence um passion patience and um and and just yeah that pers perseverance to the practice the more you do it the more you do anything you get better at it you know you start the violin you're terrible you keep doing it all of a sudden you can play you know you get on your bike you fight off you fall off you keep doing it maybe you're in races later so it's just you know the older you are the more you've been practicing at it That's so true too. Sometimes we hear from older adults that we're speaking with about the All of Us Research Program and they say, oh, I'm 
you don't want me, I'm too sick, or I have too many medications. And, you know, it's the opposite is true. We're, we're, we need to know, you know, we want to study why you are sick or why you are healthy. And the older you are, the more of a, a life history that you have. And that can benefit the program because that's a lot of information um, that's been acquired over the years. So, yeah, great. Another, another correlation. Um, I'm watching the clock here and uh, realizing we do have 201. Have there been any questions in the chat or anything that anyone would like us to answer? Um, I am viewing the chat and there are a lot of comments or great positive questions talking about how amazing the, especially uh, the art that is depicted, that depicts nature and um, all the different mediums that are being used, but, and how a lot of people are going to follow a lot of these artists on uh, social media, which is great. Um, but no questions thus far, I think, I mean, like me, everyone else was just blown away. <laughs> But uh, yes, given the time, we do not want to hold you all over. And so sadly, this has to come to an end. But I would just, Kelsey and I would both like to thank Marla so much for coming here and speaking with us and all of you today and sharing the beauty that diversity brings to all of our lives. Thank you. It's been really my pleasure. This is my favorite thing to do. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've loved it, Marla. I can tell that you were an educator. You're just so soothing. It, it's just been a bright spot um, in my day today. So thank you so much. I've enjoyed our, our walk through our global art museum and I hope our viewers have as well. And I uh, would like to remind everyone out there, if you want to learn more about the All of Us Research Program, please visit our website at joinallofus.org slash 50 forward and we'll also put that website um, in the chat and remember about um, what diversity can bring to medical research you know you can help represent your community in important studies that may lead to new research findings treatments better cures for all of us um, learn more about your own health your your family history your community's health and leave a legacy for your children, your grandchildren. You know, we're really about changing the future of medical research for generations to come. So this is an important uh, program to investigate about leaving that legacy. Um, over 350,000 of you out there have joined us so far. So thank you if you are one of those who have, have joined the program. And if any of you out there would like to become one in a million, just learn more by visiting our website at joinallofus.org. Thanks again to all of you who watched today. We're also going to put our Zoom registration link for the art class that Marla mentioned. I know there have been some signups, so don't wait on that. Limit to 12 people for that art class coming up. And please just go out and enjoy the beautiful diversity that our world has to offer. Um, happy Global Diversity Awareness Month to everyone and have a great rest of the day. Thank you for being with us.